Thank you for finding the NSE podcast on YouTube. To find links for our online hospitality security training, check out the video description below. Enjoy the Nightlife Security Podcast. You're listening to the Nightlife Security Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Black Diamond Radio. Visit blackdiamondradio.com. When Nightlife Security Consultants recommends radios to our clients, we recommend Black Diamond Radios. Why? They're the best in the business. Simple as that. Tired of the high cost of replacing broken radios? Black Diamond Radio has an industry-leading two-year warranty. If you can break a Black Diamond Radio, they will replace it. No hassles, no questions. It's time to beef up your nightlife communications. The Black Diamond D452 radio is the most durable radio on the market. Black Diamond built this radio with hospitality nightlife in mind. Built for high noise environments, it's shock and water resistant. And it has a long lasting battery. Your security team has a tough job. They need a tough radio. Need more than just radios? Black Diamond Radio is your one stop shop. Radios, earpieces for competitor brands, silicon ear molds, foam ear molds, earpiece adapters, and much, much more. Just go to blackdiamondradio.com for all your radio needs. Black Diamond Radio's customer service is second to none. Got a question? Call Black Diamond Radio during regular business hours and you'll always speak to a live customer representative ready to assist you. Get 10% off your order today. Just click on the Black Diamond Radio banner on the nightlifesecurity.com homepage or on our podcast show notes. Make sure to use promo code NIGHTLIFE7. That's N-I-G-H-T-L-I-F-E and the number 7 in order today. Welcome to the Nightlife Security Podcast, a professional resource for the nightlife security industry. Whether you're a hospitality security professional, owner, or operator, this is the podcast for you. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain. Let's get started. Well, welcome to the Nightlife Security Podcast. This is your host, Manny Marquez. As always, we're here with industry expert, Robert C. Smith. Robert, how are you doing today? Excellent. It's been a great day. Good, good, good. So uh, we're going to jump right into our topic you and I were kind of going back and forth talking about some of our clients' needs and, and the topic of last call came up, which we thought would probably be a good area for a podcast discussion. And, um, you know, one of the things that we come across when we're working with clients is oftentimes it's the actions of the ownership or management or the employees that leads to an incident. And oftentimes those incidents happen right during that last call process. So for those of you that have been in the industry, you know, last call is that, that process where normally a, a bar begins to, to uh, close down the night, wind down the night, the last drink served, and we, we normally have a span of time to wind down the business, so to speak. Um, but there's a conflict with a lot of owners. And part of that conflict, Robert, is chasing there, the money there. Yeah, there, there, there's a desire to maximize your sales and oftentimes ownership management pushes it right up into the limit. Let me, let me ask you real quick on that point. As an operator, when you were the, 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 the buck stopped with you at a couple of the venues you, you managed, how did you feel about your last call time? Um, maybe pre enlightened Manny and post enlightened Manny on that last 30 to 45 minutes of your, your night. Uh, I, I've always been very conservative when it comes to uh, I guess the decision making and and my management decisions I I think we would go to about 1 30 when our last service or when you could actually sell was uh, to 2 a.m uh, of course the problem is is depending on what state you're in some have laws in the books that's the uh, the sale of and others the consumption of I think most states now are a hard sell it's time. it's almost all our uh, sell possession consumption, and that's all lumped into at this hour, the witching hour, typically across the country. It's two a.m. with many jurisdictions, state and local, allowing a three a.m. and even like D.C., where special events, holidays, you can petition to get an extra hour till four a.m. And probably five percent of the districts around the country are twenty-four-seven. Miami, one certain areas around the country that Vegas, we've worked with, Vegas, Nevada. Uh, so let's talk about that. Let's, let's, let's just talk about the idea of closing times. And I'm, I'm interested to hear what our listeners think. When is the ideal closing time? And it's actually a discussion that's coming up with RHI 
the Responsible Hospitality Institute, they're bringing up this topic of what's a, an ideal time for closing time. And Robert, I want to get to get your uh, your input on that. So, been doing this 24 years in April this year. And when I first started at 98, I never thought about the impact various closing times or staggered closing, as many people call it, or allowing different times dependent on the night. And after about five years of traveling and realizing this, I saw that most operators forget the the chance of violence, the chance of fights, the chance of over-intox inspections by law enforcement late at night. Let's just use the example while we discuss our example will be 2 a.m. So if you're closing at 2 a.m. and your last call is at 145, now I know some of your operators are like, no way, but I know a lot of operators that do that. That means you expect to get that notice out by your DJ or your announcement, get the customer from their table up to the bar, get served amongst the, the, the throngs of people in that last 15 minutes, get their drink in their hand, and then consume it. That's right at the edge of promoting the excessive consumption of alcohol because at 2 a.m., it all stops, period. Consumption, sales, and, and, and possession. So an operator that does it at 1.30, okay, you're giving yourself 30 minutes. Well, have you really? Because when you announce it at 1.30, by the time 1.45 comes around, you decide, okay, let's wrap it up. A last call isn't a one-minute window and you're done. And I started realizing that if I could get my clients to say hard announcement at 1.15, 1.15, you make your announcement, and then at 1.30, you've given enough time during that last 15 minutes or the first 15 minutes for people to get up, go get their drinks, take their friends' orders, get up there and get it, and at 1.30, sorry, we're done. That's your last service. Now people have a real time to finish that drink, that Long Island or that gin and tonic or whatever they have. You're not forcing them to down it. Employees don't have to push them out the door. There's no server at their table saying, come on, drink up, drink up. There's no bouncer, floor host pushing them out saying, come on, you got to drink up, drink up. Those moments can be prevented if an owner or general manager manager could see the value is way worth doing an earlier last call. And, yeah. I, and I've seen it. I, I would I would totally agree with an earlier last call. I, and I think oftentimes, it would also depend on the type of night, the volume of business. It would often change from night to night. But I like the idea of a last call, an opportunity to, to get that drink in, and then an opportunity to actually enjoy that drink with that last half hour. Let me ask you this question because this comes up quite a bit. True or False. It's illegal for a bar to call last call. You've heard that. Yeah, that's false. Uh, I wonder where that came from. I think it, it, it's like a lot of things. And, and, and I mentioned this pre-starting that, that since you've been attending the classes in San Diego, LA, around the country, you chimed in on a manager side. And you brought up a real good point that 25 years ago, 30 years ago, when you started business, 25 years ago, you learned from the manager. Now, who's to say what that manager taught you was correct? Now it's a pass down of misinformation that is never checked and verified. And then you train a manager and you pass down the same misinformation. In our industry, a lot of these businesses are run by, no offense, to, and it's changed a lot in the last 10 years, but 67-year-old people that have learned the, the wrong way because that's the way we always done it. Yeah, I always imagine that it's probably uh, some sort of law enforcement said that was a law and then some per person took that as... Oh, okay, it must be the law. It must be the law. He said it must yeah. be true. So they just went ahead and continued to pass. Let me let me throw this in. We talked about individual drinks. A lot of our clients, probably fifty percent of our clients, do bottle service. That's a bottle. That's seven hundred fifty milliliters. You're going to serve them up? No, not at one fifteen. Not at one thirty. What I'm suggesting on bottle service, you have a different last call time. You have your bottle service girls or your VIP hosts or your bottle table hosts, and they come by an hour before. So let's, again, 2 a.m., 1 a.m., they're hitting that table. Are you okay? You're low. You're five people. You need another bottle. Or if they see they're already intoxicated, they've got a quarter left, they don't even ask them. It just goes by the wayside. But at 1, you can still sell the table at 12.30, 12.45. At 1, you get them a new bottle. They're probably not going to finish it by 1.45 or 2, but you're still getting the revenue. 
and you're still being able to evaluate them with enough time to deal with them, I, I believe, for the bottle service. Yeah, a lot of times we have those stories of when bottle service is involved because, again, the greed sets in and you can sell a table. I mean, some places are selling for five. One of our clients is five grand yeah, five for a table. Grand. And people are coming in and paying that at one o'clock. They see that dollar amount. Of course, they want to sell it, but they're also setting themselves up for... I guess not a very good customer experience because what you'll end up having is to rush that person through a bottle, however many number of people there are, in less than an hour. Is that really what you want to be known for? You know, so it's one of those things too that what are we giving the guests as far as an experience? And is that worse off than passing up that sale so you give them a better experience the next time? And this is in, in and I want to make sure that our listeners, if you're a if you're an employee, a server, a bartender, if you're a bouncer, a door host, an ID checker, whatever your whatever your position is in the company, you need to have an open discussion with your manager, your GM, or your owner, and have them listen to the podcast. Have them open their mind. Maybe they will open their mind a little bit because chances are they've had they and and the owners or managers will know this, and and you already know this, listener. You've had more issues, and we're saying two a.m. is your cutoff. You're done. Even if it's three a.m., you're cut off. You're done. You've had more issues in that last hour than you've had three hours before because people are primed, they're jacked, they're drunk, and now you've got to deal with them that last hour, 40, 30 minutes. And if you just finished serving earlier, you wouldn't have those issues. Again, like what I said at the top of the top of the show is a lot of times it's our actions, it's our habits, our policies, procedures, practices that get us into trouble. And the other thing I, you know, I don't like, and I'm sure a lot of listeners have had this experience is in the business, we call it the hard push. And that's when you're trying to get everybody out of the building. And oftentimes, and I've seen crews locally and, and, and when we travel, how incorrectly they do it because it's a very aggressive, you got to get out of here. Let me, let me to now the think door, about that. Finish your drink. Yeah. You know, it's that, that kind of that sing-songy TSA type of attitude. And think about think about that. Who's doing the push as we everybody knows that's what it's called do the push. Who's doing that? Is it the owner? Is it the general manager? No, they're already counting out. The owner's at home drooling on their pillow. If he's working as a, as a working owner, he's back counting the money out from the servers that have already closed out, the registers that have closed out. Who's doing the push? The guards. They've been working, you know, 8 9 hours, 4 to 7 hours. They're tired. They've been dealing with people all night long, and now they know they've got a window of 10 minutes because 2 a.m., they know, which is not true, they know they can get shut down forever and have their license revoked if they're caught serving or drinking or, or selling alcohol at 2.01. It's not true. You can get a fine. You can get an administrative issue, but you're not going to be shut down. But they're worried about it, so it's their job. So when they're angry and someone says, fuck you, who the fuck are you? I paid money for this. It just sets them off. And that's because we're doing the push 10 minutes, 15 minutes before the witching hour of 2 or 3 a.m. It's not the manager. It's not the owner. They typically don't do it. You put the employees in the position to fail by setting that time. Yeah, I, I uh, it didn't happen at a place that I worked, but I re- recall hearing a story of an owner that found out his security team was doing a hard push and he didn't like it. Uh, you know, he wasn't there every night, showed up one night, happened to be there at close, saw his staff doing the hard line push and basically yelling at customers. And he said, he told his staff, don't do anything. I don't want you to say a word. I'm going to show you that I can clear this place by myself without yelling. So the security team just sat back, owner went around, thanked everybody for coming out, asked them nicely, politely to make their way towards the front door and finish their drinks. And he was able single-handedly to clear an entire venue, which was probably, you know, a, a three, 4,000 square foot venue, two and a half, 300 people, uh, just because he, he was polite and he finessed the closing process, which, are I, so, which I always liked that. Stuff. There are so many variables. And I remember when, when I would come in to one of your venues, the variables are the lights at last call or last service. Are the lights down? Is the music still bumping? Does the G, is the DJ a part of your team or is he coming in on his own to keep that party going until 159? Or do they know where their bread is buttered and they're going to cut their music and change the song? I mean, I'm old enough to remember the songs that would play 
at 1.30 in any bar I went to were boring, you know, walk down the La Rosie Lane with your partner holding hand kind of song. They weren't party songs. And it was to get you mentally in the mood with the lights slowly going up that it was time to go. And I guarantee you, I, I haven't ever asked you this, but you have seen people when the lights start to go up and the music changes, they say, oh, oh they're closing. Let's get ready to go. Let's get our tab. And it's just done. You don't need to, to, to push. Yeah, there's a lot of the, uh, I guess, best practices when it comes to closing that I'm sure a lot of managers and operators incorporate. But I mean, since we're on the topic, let's, let's talk about them. One, you have your music. And if it's in-house music, what we used to do is be very mindful about the BPMs, bits per minute, uh, beats per minute. Uh, what you want to do is you want to slow it down. So you want to play some slower songs. Two is lighting and i was always a fan of a gradual increase in lighting uh you know most of your lighting is on dimmers so gradually bringing up the lighting so that people start getting the mental cue that we're winding down another thing would be is is if we have tvs in the establishment you start turning off the tvs you give them all these cues and hints that hey we're winding down there's, there's another one that isn't done a lot i i think maybe 10 percent of our clients do it and i love it if again as the time we're using is 2 a.m. They will not allow people in their venue at 1.30. They're done. No more re-entries. I mean, sorry, no more new entries at 1.30. And re-entry, they're done at 1.40, 1.45. Once you leave, you're gone. So that you don't have to worry about if you're closing and they know that you're serving until 1.50, they can rush down from bar A that, that stopped an hour ago or 30 minutes ago, rush into your bar in the last minute and get a quick shot or, or drink. It, it, it's it's part of that culture you have talked about a lot from the BPMs to the lights on dimmers, the TVs, um, work in that door. And and it's funny, The a lot of owners are worried that, oh, you don't know about business in this town. No, I know about business in all the towns. They're all the same. Whether it's 2 a.m. or it's 5 a.m., the same things happen. But the customers will learn and adapt if you're providing them with a good value for visiting your venue. They will want to come back and they will learn whether it's pat downs as we've talked about or metal detectors or last call, they will learn and adapt and accept what you're doing because it's to keep them safer. Yeah. I, I call that any, there's a lot of areas in hospitality where you, you do that, but it's setting the customer's expectations, right? You, you want to train your customer to behave the way you want them to behave. And if they're repeat customers, they'll get what the drill is at the end of the night. They'll you, get what the drill is at the door. You, you know, manage a venue uh, in downtown San Diego in a gas lamp for a few years. You had a rival venue beneath you. And your closing, your customers were out the door by starting to be, be on their own, moved out because of all the things you did to settle them down and get them to know it's time to leave by 140, 145. And there was no one in your bar other than maybe a boyfriend or girlfriend of a, of a bartender hanging out waiting at 2 a.m. And so your door sometimes would be shut at 150, 155. The bar below you, um, problematic. Not, very problematic. They were letting their people out and stay in a party with loud music just bumping until 150, 155. They are up to 2 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, so we, in that instance, we had... Uh, we would basically, we adjusted our, our closing time so that we wouldn't conflict with the crowd below us and get our crowds intermingled because that would just cause more problems for our doorman because... So what you did, Manny, is uh, you mentioned Jim and RHI. This came up eight years ago. It came up 15 years ago. It's called a staggered closing within business districts. You did it because you saw the value and you weren't losing that much money, if any, by closing a little bit early based on the problems you got from the, the other bar. Staggered closings are just that, where, uh, and I'm not sure how these cities have done it. I know San Jose did it for a while, and they did it in the East Coast somewhere for a while. But if all the bar owners will buy in and everyone has to carry their share of water, it wouldn't be a bad idea if it could work. I mean, if they could do it. Staggered closing would be okay. Manny's bar close, is closing tonight. Remember, 2 a.m. is our cutoff. Manny's bar is closing at 1.30. Robert's bar is closing at 2. Jimmy's bar is closing at, at, at uh, 1.30. We're not pushing 10,000 people in the middle of the gas lamp at the same time. It's 3,000, and then 20 minutes later, another 3,000, 20 minutes later, another 3,000. And if that can rotate and everyone accepts that, I think it's a, I think it's a valuable yeah, system. Yeah, especially for 
large cities or large entertainment districts, the idea that you're shoving everybody likely intoxicated out onto the street at the same time uh, increases the like, likelihood that something bad is going to happen, right? Fights, <laughs> fights from neighboring yeah. bars or just, you know. The cross-connect of people, whether it's, uh, uh, for example, a, a Jacksonville Jaguar fan in the same bar as uh, a Kansas City fan and their rivals, they're playing and one loses. We can expect there's going to be tension. That happens every night with all the normal closings where everyone's pushed out, 2,000 to 6,000 on the street. That happens every night, whether it's race, it's age, it's music, it's level of intoxication. Um, and if you're tying all that in with your last call, you're limiting the chance, you're reducing the chance that your clients, as they leave, will be the volatile, violent ones. Yeah, I, I like the idea of, for entertainment centers, large cities, I like the idea of staggered licensing times as far as you can serve. I think it just makes sense. It's logical. It makes it a lot easier for resources, city resources, police departments to manage those sorts of environments rather than, again, everyone just being dumped onto the street at, at 2 a.m. On a personal side, I, I don't like later close times. I just think the the more you get into like a 4 a.m. close time, you're kind of asking for trouble because that becomes the witching hour. So during, during the, is another story on D.C., uh, when President Obama was his, his week of the inauguration. Normally, it's a three- to four-day event. D.C. went a full seven days. They issued special. You could put in your paperwork to stay open 24 hours, serve all day, all night. And of the hundreds of liquor licenses in D.C., less than 5% put in requests to be open that long. They knew who their guests were. They knew what they were going to do. But they also had employees that, who wants to work at 5, 6, 7 in the morning? Eight, nine, ten in the morning. They they just didn't they didn't see it. It doesn't always work. The idea of serving twenty four seven or some of our clients until six a.m. or five a.m. They have opted out of that and decided. You know what? We did it for a week or two. It's just not worth it. We're going to close at our normal time. Yeah, I, I even hear. I mean, this is something that has affected a lot of businesses post COVID. I think COVID that closed down period and, and modified business uh, hours changed the way people actually do their drinking. The, that late night, 12 a.m. to 2 a.m., I don't think, at least here in San Diego, from what I've heard uh, from our clients and, and people in the business, is that appetite for consumption is just not there like it used to be. No. And so, you know, on, on this idea of, of, I'm sure on paper, business owners like the idea to have extra day parts to generate more sales but you know that i used to make the comment that your bottom line doesn't tell you how happy your staff is right so some of these concessions to limiting business hours also means that you'll likely have a happier staff because you're not asking them to work till four or five in the morning and, and i've never understood from my law enforcement background to as a as a nightlife consultant i've never understood if you're paying $50,000 a year on liability insurance, another 40000 on assault and battery insurance. So you're paying near $100,000. Why you wouldn't, so to speak, hedge your bet, give yourself the best opportunity to not even have to get into the insurance world. Set your closing time. Set your, set your last call time. Give your staff time to say, hey, we're out of here. Hey, look at this. It's empty. Give your, your door staff the chance to get out on the sidewalk, politely ask people to go home. You can't make them leave. They can stand there. But they're not as intoxicated. They're not as angry. They're not pushed out in that last moment. And, and to me, it's a no-brainer. If you're going to stay in for the long term, not that one and done, two years and you're out of it, if you're in it for the long term to make real good money and establish your, your location, you have to set some of these rules in early. And, and if you're already... You know, in the mode of doing it late, change. It's okay to change and say, okay, we did last call at 130. Let's try 145. Don't do it for two days. Do it for a month, 115. Last service at 130. Try it. You, you may think you're going to lose money, but I think in the long run, you'll see you gain money because you'll have fewer incidents, fewer trouble, fewer police visits, fewer calls for police service, and all, all that in, in, encompassed. Yeah, if you think about all the factors that lie within that idea or concept of a hard push, one, you're taking their money <laughs> at the end of the night. You're not allowing them to enjoy their drink as they would want to. 
they're wanting to continue to have fun. Then we add on top of that a bunch of doormen uh, or personnel yelling at you. To, you got to get out. Probably there's instances of people trying to walk out with a beer in their hands. So now you got to go and, hands on. And they're and, not walking fast enough, Manny. Yeah. I, uh, probably 30% of the expert witness cases I get, either with clients or against other bars or clubs, it's where the, I'm going to use the term, the bouncer, ask someone to leave, and they're walking out slowly. Their hand is in their pocket. They got their drink in their hand. I'm finishing my drink, mother effer. You got to move. And the bouncer puts her hands on them lightly. The guy says, don't fucking touch me. And he starts to turn around, and the bouncer gives him a shove because he's doing the hard push because the guy's not leaving fast and enough. And then you, you take into account, you know, being a security guard is not a, a always an easy job. You're probably, a lot of these guys are frustrated or just tired, want the night to end. Maybe there was an incident before that they're still they're dwelling human. on. They're human. Yeah. So all these emotions come out and, and you add that sense of urgency, just it's a recipe for issues to happen. And so I guess the, the, the big point of this, the big picture concept is, is that the liability will increase if you're doing hard pushes. The liability increases if you're pressing the clock to try to generate more sales and the question is, is is it worth it for the long term uh, health of the business? Is it worth that to do, worth that to do that night after night? And I think it creates a a very negative customer experience. You know, a lot, Owner, of, a, lot of, a lot of times when you look on Yelp, yeah, a lot of the Yelp is at that closing uh, when we were getting ready to leave. When we had our tab yeah. X Y Z happened, um, I would ask owners listening, general managers listening, just do an informal survey of your staff. One evening before it gets too busy, walk by and say, hey, what do you think if we uh, did our last call at this time? I, I'm almost 100% sure 100% of your staff would say, oh, that would be great. You mean we'd be out of here at 2 a.m.? We wouldn't be cleaning and doing the, the side work until 2.30? Oh, that would be great. But if you're not asking, you're not getting them involved, they're already angry. Why not? Try it. Give it a month of, of an earlier last call, and you'll find you'll have fewer issues. Yeah, and I think too, once once you do like a gradual close down from a a dollars and cents perspective, getting people to do rolling closes on stations gets personnel out quicker and chances are you probably can save some money on your labor issues or your labor percentages if you start doing that slow close type of approach rather than a hard close and everybody's cleaning up at the same time. Just something to think about. Yep. I, I would also like to know, you know, through our comments we post this podcast on our social media. I would love to hear any ideas or thoughts or tips that our listener has for closing because oftentimes we you know, we learn equally from the client as we do uh, in training them. We love the feedback. Yeah, or just general feedback you know, about the podcast or maybe we didn't hit a topic that you thought would be appropriate and we can address that at a later time. What else, Robert, before we, we wind down the show here? Just don't be afraid of change. I mean, COVID taught a lot of people a lot of things about change and adapting. And I truly believe there's nothing wrong with evaluating your system. And then if you think you need change, then change. If you don't, and you want to do last call at 145, good luck to you. But you've probably already had problems or violations after 2 a.m. And if you haven't been caught, you will be caught. My philosophy is prepare. It's not going to hurt you. Don't be afraid to change. Yeah, and I would say just... For all of our listeners, or if you're managing or operating, just get away from that hard push because it's it really does create a, a negative experience in the guest perception, likely causing yourself problems, and you're not doing yourself any good by doing a hard push like that. I think that's about it for... You know, one more thing, Manny, I, I yeah. just thought of it as a, a law enforcement. If you were to just say for a month, wherever you're at, you did your last call at 115, last serve, last drink served at 130... If you were to ask law enforcement, hey, what do you think? They're going to say, that's great. That means there's fewer drunk people, fewer problems for us. If you do that and that's the response you get from the cop, here's another tidbit for you. Send an email. Hey, Officer Johnson, remember we talked to you about our last call? Thanks for the good feedback. He's going to respond back. He or she will respond back. That's a valuable tool for you to use if you ever have problems later. Look, I was working with the police. They said we were doing good. This is something we did on our own. We know we're taking a hit, alleged hit on money, but the cops like it. That can help you in any lawsuit, in any admin discussion, in any CUP discussion with your city or your area. Uh, just don't forget, 
getting law enforcement involved on a positive change you're making. Your your comment reminded me of uh, another thing that I had in mind when we were discussing this podcast. They did this in Pacific Beach uh, here in San Diego. Everybody did the two o'clock close times, but what they coordinated with the, the local bars, coordinated with the police department was was to wear the yellow safety vests that were with the reflective surface what, on them. What they did though, Manny, and, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but what they did is on the entertainment permit, it says on all the liquor licenses here in San Diego, it says you must take reasonable control of the premise, the outside premise, sidewalk area of your liquor license established up to and including 30 minutes before and after closing. So these operators are like, what do you mean? I got to have people out there? And the city said, look, just have a couple of guys out front 30 minutes before trying to get people to go home, Thirty min- up to 30 minutes of closing. They decided to put those bright glow night safety vests on them. And they found that, and I'm sure you're going to say this, but they found that people coming down the street maybe a little intoxicated, both walking and driving, would see 30 glow- glowing vests. And they naturally assumed they were all police, and they went the other way. And it was just another way to yeah, get so the crowds it, to disperse. It was a, a deterrent, got people to move. But it was also, the, the other side of that was, is if there was an issue, police had an easier time identifying... Readily identifiable. ...who were the security guards, or quote-unquote, the good guys in, in the situation. So that was super helpful. Uh and the other thing I was going to say is, is if you're in a, an entertainment district or you have a lot of venues that are neighboring bars or, or restaurants, coordinate with your neighboring business for that last call outside, making sure we're monitoring, you know, the not only the premise, but which would be the sidewalks and, and I guess what you would call the nexus. So the, the idea you just propose, I, I can see business owners thinking it's a great idea and then thinking of their 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 competition operator owner let's just say a smaller business district with 10 10 locations 10 liquor licenses if they all got together and met and said hey why don't we do this month by month or week by week where u5 bars close 15 minutes earlier than we5 next month next week we'll swap it and it's you know the the hit and miss of the money, the weekends, the holidays, and we'll do that for a six to eight month period. Man, if, if operators could come together and work like that for the staggered closing, the the last call times, the number of fights that just would not occur, the number of late night uh, street level shootings and fights just wouldn't occur if the owners could get together to start solving the problems before they happen. Yeah, that's the, the name of the game is to be proactive and and prevent the issues from even starting in the first place. And, you know, that's what we preach and that's what we teach in the classrooms. Um, Robert, as always, we, we've gone over our limit of 30 minutes, but there's always a, a good discussion, good topics, and, and good things to talk about. And again, for the listener, if there's anything that we missed as far as discussion points, make sure to leave that in the comments of the podcast. Other than that, thanks for joining us. Have a fantastic day. My name is Manny. I'm here with Robert C. Smith, security expert. We'll see you next time. Hey, listeners, before we go, I just wanted to thank you for spending the time today with us, listening in on the conversation. Uh, If you want to learn more about what we do and how we can help your venue achieve your security goals, as far as operations goes, visit us at uh, nightclubsecurity.com. You're going to find a whole bunch of free resources, uh, anything to do with hospitality security, as well as our online training programs. Uh, we have to offer if there's any sort of questions comments the things you like to to ask us feel free to 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 send me an email Uh, my email address is manny m-a-n-n-y at nightclubsecurity.com we would love to hear from you and until next time uh, this is manny marquez thanking you for listening and until then be safe